Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillespie. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, everybody out there in podcast land. This is record producer Joe Solo, and I'm on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. I had the pleasure of seeing Joe speak at the NAM conference back in January. It was really cool talking about you with your team, talking about producers, production, music industry, and all those things, and how do you get inside the minds of uh, the people that, that, well, ultimately, you do a lot of this kind of thing, helping people figure out how to get into yeah. the music industry. You've worked with some of the biggest names, written music or produced music for some of the biggest brands in the world. We could talk about that. Uh, just really quick, M- Macy Gray and Fergie, I mean, that's good enough for me. Well, right? I developed Macy from scratch. Yeah, so that's incredible. That was just a quick 17 years before we <laughs> had some overnight success. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it is in the podcast world, too. You go and you pour your heart and your soul into something that you believe in and then it's up to the at some point it's up to the audience to go oh yeah, well, yeah. I've, got, I've got a a theory on that in the music business your success is based on the irrational thoughts of millions of strangers who you'll never meet yeah because if you think about it people like either they either like music or they don't they either feel it or they don't it's not like they're going to analyze and go oh that's a great key and a perfect bpm and therefore i like it you know <laughs> yeah. it just it hits them uh, in their subconscious, and that's of course where irrational thought exists. Yeah. So your success is dependent on the irrational thoughts of millions of strangers you'll never meet. It is. It's absolutely true. <laughs> that, that's a good way to dissuade somebody from being in the music business. But the thing is, it's yeah. fun. It's oh, so it, much fun. It's fun. And then the other thing, like as you collect these irrational people that identify themselves with you you are writing that song for them in a way that you never even considered oh yeah well i'm not saying they're irrational i'm saying where the the irrational thought (laughs) of the brain exists in all of us well we're all a little (laughs) yeah we're all a little bit but um yeah you know music is interpretive and uh you know one as a songwriter one of the uh things i like to keep in mind is to try and have a unique take on something on a universal subject so it's something that people can relate to sure like there's a book i'm writing um as part of my uh whole music success workshop Mm -hmm. division which is where i help other people how to break through in music i wrote the definition of a good song is a good song expresses what people don't know how to say yeah i think that's perfect I want to let you guys know, too, joesolo.com for all the information on what he does. If you're uh, looking for more, musiccareersuccess.com is another area of of information. Also, at joesolo1 on Twitter. He's not really active on Twitter very much, but I am at Pete Turner or at Break It Down Show or at JohnLG69 to, to get John. Any of us can get you over to where Joe is doing his work. Obviously, thanks to Nam for letting us help cover and all those things. But you're talking about songwriting. So one of the things that John and I do, John's up in the Bay this today, so it's mm-hmm. me riding solo, but we do a thing called an album fight, right? And here's, here's what an album fight is. You take two... That sounds cool. Oh, no, it's super cool. You take two similar level albums. Doesn't have to be the same genre, just caliber, right? And you collide them together. Try to have the tracks match up in terms of numbers. So 10 on 10 is better than 10 on 12. But if the fight needs to happen, it can be 12 tracks to 10 tracks. Are you tracks. talking about an audio mashup, basically? No. Hang on. I'm going to get you there right, right now. So track one is track one versus track one is round one. Ding, ding. Track okay. two versus track two. Ding, ding. And so it, it's completely has nothing to do with the quality or the caliber or anything, anything going on. But we look at in this song. So like right now, this week, we're going to do ACDC Black, Back in Black. Oh, one of my favorites. Versus Michael Jackson Bad. Mm, nice. And so now you're looking at Hell's Bells versus Bad, and you're like, uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> good God, which one's better and why? You know, you've got this. Well, I can already answer that, Hell's Bells. But <laughs> okay, why? And I'm a, and wait, and I'm a lover of Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. I've done work uh, 
with him. Um, but I'm also a lover of ACDC. Yeah. Hell's Bells. It's funny. I was talking to my daughter who's learning this on guitar. Uh-huh. Um, that little pink Stratocaster over there. That's okay. hers. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the perfect wake-up song. Okay. Because it starts with this bell. Yeah. And then, you know, the riff comes in. And slowly things start to build. Like uh-huh. you're just waking up and getting going. And then once the beat kicks in, it's like, okay, now you're getting dressed. Yeah. You get excited about the day. And then, boom. It has nothing to do with the lyrics. Just the feel is like a, the perfect wake-up song. Yeah. Um, but then again, I mean, Bad is a, an amazing record. Boy, that's that's interesting because I think you picked two records to duke it out that are each great in their own world, in yeah. their own style. Right. So how do you how do you determine who the winner is? This is the is thing. Is it more of a debate, like Ebert and Roper style? So we'll have three. Or do you have people vote? Or so no? and the, and if you can do one with us. But sure. so John and I are like the, the normal judges. We have two judges, and then you would be the guest judge. And then we do a oh. ten pa- ten point must like regular boxing. Uh, an eight is like a standing eight count, and a seven, which we've only ever had one, is like this person's a band can't be knocked out because then we've done a bad fight creation, you know. So, yes, uh, let's see what what's a good album to think of? Um, Black Sabbath, Paranoid. Okay. Right, huge start. First four songs are rock and roll pillars. Can't be, but after that, it kind of lightens up the pace. So when the other band keeps coming and they win six rounds to four, you're like, wow, you know, this is crazy. But that's yeah, what happens. That's so, interesting. So like you would be a judge, we'd be a judge. And then, you know, they're always close because you're putting close albums up. Uh, last week we did Squeeze, Cool for Cats versus Queen the Game. Mm. And we took two and purposely did this. We took Queen because they're probably overappreciated, legendary band, but maybe people get a little bit like, you know, their greatest hits are so solid when the other tracks are there that aren't as brilliant. You're like, oh, wait, there's actually some really terrible harmonic sounds in here. You know, some there's some bad. Like like when you really literally listen. hit or miss. Right. It's a hit. <laughs> like yeah. An actual hit. Absolutely. Or it's a miss. Yeah. So hey, wait, there's, a ga- there's a game show in there somewhere. <laughs> right. Yes. Hit or miss. Hit or miss. Right. And the new, new, new bands can try out their material. Right. I don't know. Maybe I'll develop that. As you should, because well, my 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 company, um, the whole team of executives, just yesterday we had a meeting, uh, bouncing around different ideas on TV show pitches, yeah, uh, for Netflix, and we came up with some really crazy stuff, yeah. But uh, anyway, um, well, but you get the idea is, yeah. is you go through, and so album, the uh, the art form of creating an album and sending someone on a journey is really kind of washed away. And it really is like, you've got this, uh, like the beach boy, we had beach boys, pet sounds versus Sergeant Peppers and they line up and, and you go after it. And those transitional songs, we're just going to have an interlude or we're going to have a reprise. Those become very weak rounds. And sometimes they line up with the other reprise, but sometimes they don't. And then all of a sudden Billy Joel gets a free round against whoever he's going against. Cause he didn't, <laughs> you put an actual song up, even if it's not a great song. Do do you ever put songs. one band's record against the same band's record, like Dark Side versus you know versus the Wall or Side One, Side know. Two kind of thing? Or, I mean, or, or um, even that too. Yeah. But but like Dark Side versus the Wall. Yeah. That's that would be. We have not done that. We this is know, a newer thing. We we've done a number of them now, but we've not done that. And we definitely don't mind crossing genres. But yeah, having a band fight itself, even like in a double album, you know, like. Record one from San Denista for the class versus record two or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, as long as it's not greatest hits, that's that's the main thing. Not, yeah, that would be kind of cheating because that's not really right. the record. That's right. just a, you know, an amalgamation of yeah. all the stuff that, that does work. And if you do a cover, we give a negative penalty for that unless your cover is the version everybody thinks of. So like Ice Cream Man from Van Halen, nobody thinks. I right, can't remember the right. I was name just even. I was just thinking of you really got me. You know, right. Van Halen. Well, yeah. Depending depending on where your age breaking point is, sure. you're either Kinks or you're Van Halen. Right. Um. And so th- th- in that case, we'd say, okay, that's that's a strong cover. We're not going to really penalize. And then is it better than the other song it's against? And like, did they make? Do they put a twist on it? Like like when I when I talk to aspiring musicians. Yeah. Um, a lot of them 
do covers and I always encourage original material. Um, yeah, for so many reasons, but sometimes I'll get someone in the studio and maybe all their friends and family told them, you know, Oh, you're such a wonderful singer. And maybe she did like a Celine Dion song, like my heart will go on Yeah, and just, you know, blew it away. And then, right get that person in the studio with an original song and they have no idea what to do. Well, that's because they've had Celine Dion as a template on how to sing, <laughs> you know, my heart will go on. And, yeah. and that's a lot easier to do. Yeah. So, so it, it could be jarring. Right. If you don't have that experience, if you don't know what you're getting into. Um, it is jarring. So let me ask you this then, you know, with the album fight concept in mind, you'll have two songwriters line up. Like, for example, we had Nirvana and U2 fight, right? So you basically have Bono's words versus Kurt Cobain's words. And we just didn't get enough time for Kurt to develop. And you can see it in this format hmm. where you see the – you understand the brilliance of what Kurt has done, but a lot of it's high school notebook lyrics. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's great. And in the context of this song and this album, wonderful. But look what's going on over here in the other corner. And it's clearly better. So not to say that Kurt Cobain's a bad songwriter in any form, but songwriters do evolve. Some are better at words. When you've got a young act coming up and, and they write a, a party rock song, you know, or I, I see a girl and she's hot and she makes me excited song, that song's been written a million times and will always be written. But how do you, how do you push them to a place where they can get to? And you can easily push them too far. But how do you push them to find something new in that very worn out uh, system? Um, a lot of times at the very beginning of, of making a record with an act, I spend a fair amount of time hanging out with them, getting to know who they are as people. Okay. And it's amazing. Artists, they'll, to a producer that they trust, and the key is trust, they will open up about the most personal situations because... If I just ask, hey, what's this song about? It may be a very personal situation that they don't want to share with too many people. Yeah. In its raw form, in the story form. But in the song form, they can express themselves and, and do that. So I have to understand who they are so that I could synergize with them to make a record that best represents who they are. Mm. And at the same time, if it's a, if it's a newer artist, I'm trying to develop a signature sound, right? So they sound unique. That's key. Yeah. And so it's it's really a process of really getting to understand the artists or your co-writers, your collaborators, who they are, and try and tap into that when you need to. A lot of times you'll get someone who's like really talented but can't write lyrics but think they can. Oh, okay. That's the case. I just have to be really straightforward and say, I think we need to, we need to bring in a professional lyricist who yeah. can understand what you're all about and then craft songs that you can still feel passion for singing, but it'll be so much faster and better and it's worth it. And also when you bring in collaborators, I'm, I'm big on collaboration because you get this great synergy. You, come up with ideas that no one would come up with by themselves. Right. You know, your ideas and my ideas, they have little baby ideas, and those are, the, those are the winners. And then also, just from like a purely business perspective, you've got another professional hustling the song. Right. You know, and, and the chances of, of it making more money, are, you know, are increased by a third. So that's cool, too. <laughs> when two really good songwriters, uh, Lennon McCartney, when they get together – or whoever it's going to be. Maybe it's uh, Michael Hutchins and um, – God, I can't think of his name right now. And somebody else. Yeah, yeah. well, the other guy – so sometimes they bring something that you can't get to yourself. Like, okay, sure, you made some words rhyme, but give this oh, song to man. Glenn Ballard. Don't get me started on rhymes. Right. Sometimes sometimes people just want to – they're struggling with a song, and they just want to feel like they – they finished it, and they'll go to some place like RhymeZone.com, right? Where, which is actually a great resource if you're looking for words because it breaks it down by rhyme, sound alike, and syllable. I'm sure. Just, but 
a lot of times someone will go to a site like that and just grab a word that rhymes that fits with the rhythm so they can plug it in and tell themselves oh great the song is done and yeah yay but it's not it's it's not until every single word everyone yeah. propels the listener forward within the story and touches whatever emotions the song is supposed to touch in the listener whether it's anything from the worst heartbreak and loss through celebration and, and if, I was I was at the car wash the other day and the the song Celebration by Cool and the Gang came yeah, on right and I was I was really analyzing it and it's it's such a brilliant song the whole arrangement the horns these little guitars everything and then the words yeah you know they're not complicated but a celebration shouldn't be a complicated lyric you know mm -hmm. celebration time come on yahoo <laughs> right right and when i'm on my phone i'm i'm listening i'm just want to make sure i get the words right no problem so when elton john sits down he's got a lyric from bernie toppin and he doesn't worry about the lyric anymore and bernie creates this world that John then fills on his songwriting into the deal, and he brings in Crocodile Rock or whatever it's going to be. I mean, we were looking at um, Up the Junction in the album fight with Squeeze and Queen, mm -hmm. and it's like Chris Difford hands Glenn Tilbrook 400 words. He hands him an essay, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to take my Cockney accent, and I'm going to say crazy-ass things. You know, like One of the lyrics that they have is Arrow in his at and Cool for Cats. You know, but like if I say arrow in his hat, that's not as good as when he goes arrow in his hat, you know, and it becomes something better. <laughs> when, when do you find someone else in the band? Do you go hire Glenn Ballard who will gladly come down and spend time and, and create a song that is at least as good and probably better than what the band has? I mean, because he won't worry about the one word. He'll say this whole line, mm. this it, whole stanza well, out, do this. If if we need to go outside. Mm -hmm. If we need to go outside, there's a whole stable of writers that I, right, that I have long-standing creative relationships with, and so I'll select someone who I think can nail it for that act. Yeah. So like, um, like one of my collaborators, she wrote for Barbara Streisand, and she does a lot of theater and things like that. Yeah. Well, if it's some rock band, she's, I'm not going to bring her in. Right. You know, I got this other guy. The beat might be going like boom, 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 boom. He'll come up with a boom, 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 boom. Just that noise. Uh, uh -huh. I'm no singer, but. <laughs> You're doing it. As you can tell. And, and he can reach into this sort of guttural thing. So, it it, it, you know, I try to make a good match, but I also write myself so first the first person i'm going to go to as an outside writer is myself of sure. course yeah i find with bands because there's so many people involved there's multiple brains already involved they usually don't need outside help as much as say like a solo singer okay or a lot of times uh i'll work with a singer and he or she may have a brilliant concept the storyline is brilliant, but it could be told in a more poetic way. One of the um, things I always say when it comes to writing lyrics is don't tell me, show me. Right. Okay. Okay. So, for example, you can say, um, I walked into the room and she was crying. Right. That's, okay, telling. that's telling, right? right? Or, you know, when I walked into the room pictures of her lost love yeah were everywhere right and they were and they were drenched right tissues yeah. on the floor something like that S something that just paints the picture mm -hmm. that was probably not the best example in the world yeah well we're um, freestyling so that's all right yeah and i still haven't had enough of my snack to get my brain sugar going here so <laughs> well okay so let me <laughs> jump in then and and talk a little bit about as you work with a band and you said you want to build trust You've been doing this a long time. So when you say yes to a band, you know, it's it's a big deal for them. And there's trust and there's the other the, the other end of it is the band going, holy fuck, Jesus Christ, Joe Solo said yes. 
you know, we can't blow with this, you know, like they want to be over eager. They want to over deliver and all these things. You've got to, I'm sure, slow them down and say, slow down, everybody. Well, I got to tell them yeah. that it's the ideas themselves that have merit, not who comes up with them. Because a lot of times I might suggest something and, and the artist isn't really digging it, but they'll go with it anyway because I'm the pro or I'm Joe Solo or whatever like that. Right. And so I tell them right away, don't do that. We got to serve the song. Yeah. First. Right. Not our egos and not, and, and not, you know, walk on eggshells with each other. Yeah. If something's not working, just say so. And that way we can get a better song. Don't assume because I've developed, you know, Grammy winners that have sold millions of records sure that i'm gonna be right every time or my ideas are better but you do have to have some rigor in that process though i mean well i just, I just say that in the beginning okay. so they feel comfortable just being honest right if they're not feeling it you know and, and if i think it's a good idea also I'll, I'll fight for an idea if i have to and i i ask them to fight for two i don't mean fight like really fight but but really you know sometimes somebody comes up with an idea that's so good it doesn't hit you right away, mm -hmm. the brilliance of it. Yeah. U2 does something like this. I love U2, by the way. It's, I always yeah. talk about them. But They're a favorite of mine. Yeah. They they don't want good to get in the way of great. And so if an idea is good, they're going to try to kill it. And they're going to pull out the dobro and do it in a, you know, a duo with a dobro and a tambourine. And if the song can survive these different iterations, oftentimes they go back to version one, but they're going to see what's there. And push the idea hard and see if it dies, or push it and see if it grows in a different direction and becomes something else altogether. But is that something that a seasoned band can do and that a young band would struggle with? I mean, does the young band have the horsepower to to stay and work at it? And no, I mean, YouTube knows what it really is. depends on the artist's character. I okay, mean, and that's why it's important for me to get to know them in the beginning too. Like, they have to be great. They have to be funded. And they have to be, they have to have something going on, a big audience or management or a record deal or something. Those are the prerequisites because if that, if that, if that musical greatness isn't there, all I could do is make a larger than life yeah. piece of crap, you know, <laughs> a crystal clear, if they have horrible songs and they won't budge on, on, outside influences must go with those songs then all i could do as a producer is take those songs and make their crappiness shine so obvious and yeah. bright and you know so it always it always starts with great songwriting okay you know all the all the production in the world on a movie won't save a terrible script no right you get right. all the cgi yeah. and explosions and top stars but if the script doesn't bring the clever yeah. You know, it's going to fall flat on its face. And it's the same with songs. Somehow we always get there. And sometimes we get there very quickly. Sometimes the songs are perfect. And I don't, you know, there's nothing to do in terms of changing anything in terms of the writing. That, right. that happens a lot as well. And the thing is, is that you got your whole life to write your first record. Yeah. So you've had a chance to write and rewrite these songs. You had a chance to perform them for people and get feedback and all that. You really, the tough one is your second record. Sure. Especially if your first one's successful, then you got you know six months to a year to bang out the second one, and the expectation is that it'll be better and outsell. And yet, if you've been on the road all year promoting the first record, uh huh. So one thing I advise artists on the long, on the big picture, is to always save one or two of their better songs for the second record. Give yourself a head start. Yeah, and that's hard to do because if the first record tanks, there is no second record. Right. It's yeah. really difficult to do. Yeah. But you have to write songs every day anyhow, right? So if if a band has potential and they're writing a song every day, even you know, if they write three hundred songs in a year, how many of those songs are album quality, do you think? I know it's a big question, but no, I, 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 I mean, if that's your a real gifted lyricist writing a song every day, mm -hmm. that it might be good to write every day.
for your craft, but writing a song just to write a song every day, I think, you know, it might yield you, you know, three or four good songs. I mean, we're, I, I'm, I'm going for hits. I'm looking right. for hits. Okay. And where it, do the hits live then? If, if, if they're not necessarily living in repetition, what's, what does someone who thinks they have hits in them, what do they do to get them out? <laughs> well, first of all, everyone thinks they have hits. Like, Absolutely. A couple of years ago um, at another NAMM show um, talk, I asked everybody, how, how many people, there's like maybe, I don't know, four or 500 people in the room. And I asked, how many people in here are songwriters? And like almost every hand goes up. Yeah. And then just for fun, I said, and how many of you are hit songwriters? And almost every hand goes up. <laughs> More hands and go then, up. <laughs> it, 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 just about the same amount. And yeah. then everyone busts out laughing because yeah. everyone realizes, wait, we can't all be hit songwriters. You yeah. Know? And yeah. the point was made right there. Like, what is what is a hit? There's there's it's a, a hit. It just is a song that really resonates with a lot of people that that's a hit it's catchy and it's hook laden i've got a saying but you can you checks. can put catchy and yeah. hooks together and absolutely miss too though you know like well, you, you can so you, have to, you have to you have to bring the clever remember that song all star by smash mouth yeah 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 they they were having trouble breaking through and just for fun just to like get the crap off their brain they said let's let's take every meaningless cheesy hook instrumentally lyrically rhythmically everything that that we could think of just the most generic hooks yeah. we could think of right and mash them together into one song yeah and that was all star which is a great song and yeah. very hooky a big hit and it's the one that broke them through and it's mind-boggling uh how much money a hit single can generate it makes it makes lives when adele came out her record label that she was signed to in england was called x recordings or no i'm sorry x i think it's xl recordings they were doing three million gross a year and then two years after she came out 133 million is Crazy. what they grossed yeah and, and that was based off a song yeah you know it's just it's unbelievable it's, so really a hit single that's that's what everyone's really after. That's that's you know like in the gold rush. That's like finding that vein of gold that is very rare. Yeah. But you know you got to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, and who knows if you'll ever find it or not. You will find something though, if you work that hard. Yeah, you might find you might find your limit, and a lot. Sure. Uh, I, I remember reading about. Some some guy who gave up. He dug for a while and he gave up. He sold his equipment and went back home with his you know his tail between his legs. He sold the rights to this mine to these investors who hired some geologists. Yeah. Who knew something about tectonic plate shifts, and turns out the guy was like five feet to the right of where the main oh. vein was. Right. And had he gotten the information instead of just gave up. He could have struck it rich. And this is where I come in. Yeah. Is I try and help aspiring professional musicians get the information they really need to be as successful as they can on their terms. I put together a set of these uh, music success video nuggets. They're free okay. and tips. And if someone wants them, all they have to do is my, go to my website, joesolo.com, and sign up. Yeah. And... Uh, they'll get the first one right away. It's called How to Get Your Music in Film and TV, yeah. which is a real good one because there's no faster way to make money and get worldwide recognition yeah. for your music than getting in a movie or a TV show. There's no doubt. You get to be the girl that sings that song in that Disney movie. Yeah. That's a career launcher and possibly a career. You just go and go and go. But it's so, very satisfying. Too. Yeah, super satisfying. So when someone does do something like that, so they watch your video and they get some ideas, is that enough or is there still a lot more? Like, like do they need more help? Because obviously that's just one little – that's a piece of an element that you, you're going to give. Well, there's, so, there's so much to learn, but, but I try and get straight to the stuff that will make a difference. Yeah. Sometimes I could say so, – uh, 
couple sentences that might be life altering. I'll give you an example. There was there was this gentleman who came to uh, one of my Malibu retreats. What he had done was he had taken his entire library of music. It was about forty songs. Yeah. And he attached them all as MP3s. Uh, bought a resource book of music supervisors, and in one day emailed everybody forty songs. Yeah. And he didn't realize that most music supervisors can't stand attachments and that they want links because it bogs down their email accounts and they sit there and spend their time deleting those emails and just yeah. getting, you know, ticked off. And so like here the guy thought, wow, I really moved my career forward. Yeah. But it gets even worse because like all the music supervisors, they all know each other. They have lunch together. They're best yeah. friends. Uh-huh. It's a very tight knit industry. Right. So, They'll be at lunch, and one of them will be like, man, I can't believe this kid sent me 40 songs. Like I, like, I have time to listen to 40 songs, and none of them had anything to do with the shows I'm working on. Right. He clearly didn't do his research. Right. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. I'm not going to do business. I don't care how great his music is. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. And, um, and I can't work with someone like that because someone who doesn't know what they're doing might mess up a whole deal. Let's say I get a song get a director to fall in love with a song for their montage and then this yeah. this uh, uninformed songwriter he wants $180,000 for it this episode of the break it down show is brought to you by lions rock productions that's us we publish evaluate and develop podcasts just like this one consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies so if you're launching or expanding your social media presence your business or your personal brand or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level reach out to us on twitter at p day turner or at john lg 69 at the break it down show there's a thousand ways to get a hold of us now enjoy the show. When typically he might get 5000 for it. Right. Yeah. And that's going to make me look really bad. Uh-huh. And that's going to blow trust between the director and myself. Right. And, you know, all anybody really has in this business is their reputation. Sure. So yeah. you can't take a chance on someone like that, no matter how good their music might be. Imagine there's a, a lunch up in Hollywood, and there's eight or nine top Hollywood supervisors all eating together, and one of them's like, "Man, this kid sent me, you know, forty of his songs on an email." Oh, and they all groan like, "Oh, that's awful," you know. Yeah. And uh, who was it? Yeah. And he mentions the name. They're like, "Oh yeah, I got that. I got an email from that guy too. Yeah. Me too. Me too." <laughs> Obviously, he didn't take the time to do the research on what projects they're working on. He didn't respect their time thinking they're just going to drop everything they're doing and music supervisors are just so busy. Right. Especially at, at the ones who are working on television because yeah. they've got a harsh broadcast deadline every single week. Every they, don't, week. they don't have yeah. time to mess around. Yeah. So it's really important, just like the people who got the information on tectonic shifts to find the vein of gold, it's important to get the information you need to know about how this industry operates, right. what the secret handshakes are, sure. what the do's and don'ts are. That's one of the things I focus on when I'm when I'm doing retreats or writing a book or talking at a podcast right now. Yeah, yeah. It's just to try and help artists break through and get their dream because those music dreams never die. There's a never. weird a weird thing that happens perception wise, you know, in across any industry where we as the other person, as the artist that wants to break through and send that email out to all of the music supervisors, you you don't understand what their life is. And so you make these assumptions where like, oh, they, they, they're not doing anything. Like, police, or I'm so good, they'll drop everything for me. For sure. Yeah. And let's understand this. No one gives a fuck about your idea. You know, like everybody's got a great idea. It takes a lot more than that to get in the door. But you have like this perception of uh, police violence against whatever, inner city right. kids. Well, they just need more training. And so now flash to the guy that runs training for the police department. He's like, gosh, I wish I had 80 more hours of training to give out. You know, like that guy's already working pretty much at max capacity, you know, and then the, like the guy that runs like the manning for all the police in the fields, like I sure do have a surplus of cops in the field. I I wish I had something to take up more time like, tra you know, like that isn't a reality. That's 
Well, yeah, these yeah. guys are already doing a lot. You music have to supervisors find... are the most jocked people in the industry I'm right sure. now. Sure, everybody wants their music right in film or TV, your video games. Uh, so you can't blast and... your way to this. You can't just well, outwork the problem. You got to show how you're going to help them make their job easier. Mm-hmm. I get people writing me, "Hey, Joe, uh, I'm from England. I'm coming into LA, and I was wondering if you could uh, call up your main contacts." And set some meetings for me. Yeah. I mean, that's how I met this person. It was an email that said that. And I was uh-huh. like, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> you, know, not, not, you know, I'm happy to share the wealth to to a certain degree, but yeah. I don't think I'm just going to take the 30 years of relationship building and yeah. refer someone I don't even know. I don't see, yeah. And obviously, because they know, didn't know that that kind of self-centered approach doesn't work i already know yeah kind of who they are all right where their character is and making it in music is all about your character all yeah. about your character on twitter all the time i get hit up in general and it's all robots and if it's not it's it's just a person automating as much as they can what they want to do but hey do you need beats like what about my account profile makes you think i need beats i, I don't need beats i don't want to hear your new music I am interested in how you found me, you know, to have a conversation because maybe I'll have you on my show because I'll have, I'll have anybody on my show. You know, I'm, I'm glad to give someone a break, but it can't be a one way street where like, like my stuff, subscribe and like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> Slow down. But songwriters have that perception. And I guess there's people that make it by just absolutely hammering and pounding and pounding. No, I, I don't, I, you don't think there's, so? there's persistence, mm-hmm. but you have to have professional persistence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, someone sends me some music. If I say I'm going to listen to it, I don't want to get a call that night. Well, did you listen to it? What do you think? Huh? You want to hire me? Yeah. <laughs> so how how like fast can someone follow up? Someone someone sends you an email. Hey, I'd love for you to give me give me your thoughts on your music. I understand that you're busy. Um, I'm going to follow up in a week. Is that fair? Something like that. Yeah. Well, I I do a lot of private coaching, one on one consultation. And a big part of that is song analysis. Okay. So I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a quick spin and rattle off one or two quickies. Mm-hmm. But if they really if they really really want to improve and make some headway, right? I suggest signing up for a consultation. I I charge a lot for it too, and I don't I don't do these too often because they kind of interrupt the day. Uh huh. Yeah. But but I do them. If someone uh, if someone's approach is professional and kind and respectful and sure and if there's there's, there's got to be something there even if the music isn't good and their approach is good there's 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 just something there yeah to, to give me an excuse I'm so busy you know right. every hour counts like I'm I'm talking about missing sleep or missing time with my kids yeah that's you know that's so, what you're asking for. So, this is that person on the other end of your, your thought is like, no, this person really is busy. They're already doing everything they can do, and you want an hour or you want this. You've got to have something to return the favor. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give it a quick spin, or maybe even I'll just give it you know, a verse and a chorus, and I'll just, whatever quick thoughts come to my mind. And I only, I only really need one listen to properly analyze a song. It, it, yeah. It, 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 it'll tell me so much. Like the other day... I was doing a consultation for somebody and um, I popped on the song and w- within like 10 or 20 seconds, I-, I hit pause and I said, I'll bet you that at the studio you did this with, there was no producer and the engineer had a ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, how could you know that? How could you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because... These very 80s sounding guitars and right. playing guitars is is yeah. on there, and uh-huh. so it it sounds to me like you got you got maybe like an engineer who also played guitar on it, mm-hmm. who still has the 1980s little ponytail. Yeah, yeah, and that's where his style is, and I can hear that, and that's and guys who play guitar in 2018 that sounds like the 80s tend to dress this way yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty pretty funny but 
all you know, and, and it was a sound of like a Marshall stack and sure. Floyd yeah. Rose, you know, dive bombs and just yeah. all this stuff that just said I'm stuck in the '80s as a guitarist. Yeah, you know, and not that there's anything wrong with '80s music, but if you're trying to come out as a new artist, a current artist, chances are, you know, the '80s lead guitar thing is not going to work given where music is and what what the guitar's role in music is nowadays. What is that role? Oh, well, it's depending on the style, but it's 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 much more rhythmic and supportive than shredding leads. Yeah. It's much more rhythmic and supportive and also where where I'd like to push it uh, cuz I'm a guitar player, it's my primary instrument. I'm looking at about ten different guitars. Yeah, on my the, left shoulder. the Gibson SG over there—that's my main one. Uh-huh. Uh, I love that thing. I'm trying to push the guitar in sort of a more psychedelic place that it has not gone to yet, but over EDM and hip hop beats. Okay. And with sonics that are not reminiscent of the past, mm. but I—I got to be thinking whether it's my own music or somebody else's i have to be thinking about two years into the future yeah we're gonna want to push the style to because it takes two years to properly set up a marketing campaign and get the record out make the record get it out and all that so even if you're producing a sound that's current today by the time the record comes out it's two years in the past it's yeah two years old sounding and when, that's no good when you say that i know you work with a lot of newer groups but when you talk about it in terms of managing your audience, you know, you have to grow with your audience. There's a lot a lot of people like that shredding, virtuosity, 80s bass kind of guitar, right? Do they it, like but that. But do it, put a twist on it. Okay. Do it, in a new, new, do it in a new way. Instead of like it sounding like it's in the 80s. Right. Take that, you know, there's there's a concept in marketing that applies in music too. And that is taking something that's, very classic and well known, and marrying it with something that's brand new. Is that what Bruno Mars does, or does he go a little closer to the source? Because I mean, you hear you you listen to any. I've heard Perm on the way over, and that's James Brown and a bunch of whole other yeah, things. Yeah, um, Bruno, Bruno Mars, first of all, is quite incredible. I think. Yeah, for sure. But he he is like a very modern version of seventies disco, but he's not singing like the Bee Gees falsetto. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's not he's not it doesn't and the sounds, the sonics sound like modern instruments that harken to the seventies. Right, okay. And the arrangements harken to the seventies. They point to it. But there's this they're still modern. One thing that's really cool about Bruno Mars is that he's got this diversity that he gets away with that I think is very hard to get away with. Mm. Because you have to have an identifiable style or sound. Like a lot of people will come to me and like, look, I can sing country. I got a country song. I got yeah. a rock song. Yeah. I got a hip hop song where I rap. I can do all these things. And that's going to be confusing to your audience because it's going to be like, well, who are you? Right. You know, that person will never get signed by a record label. Sometimes someone will think I've got all these talents. I could do anything. So tell me what you want me to be. Yeah. There's no character in that. There's no knowledge of self. And the record company they can't tell you who you are and who you want to be. That's your job is to have such a strong sense of your musical identity that when they hear it, they get it. It's, it's, it's clear that you have actualized the belief in your music with the actual music. I'm thinking about Lenny Kravitz and when he first came out, it was sure. like, you know, oh, that's Jimi Hendrix. That, like someone has to do this. Jimi Hendrix died, you know. So, And when you look at when he came out, Jimi Hendrix had died really only about 15 years before like when he first started making music. But he did find his voice. And yes, there's roots of Jimi Hendrix in it. But how does how does he get there? Is that it's obviously partly his own journey, but is it also the producers that kind of help him figure out his voice so he's not just this Jimi Hendrix knockoff? Hmm. I, I don't know if I could agree with the assessment that he's a Jimi Hendrix knockoff. I'm talking way back in the beginning. You because know, that's just Hendrix is such a such was was had many guitar firsts. Yeah. And Lenny is Lenny is you know he he can't play guitar 
remotely at the same level as Jimi Hendrix. But I understand what you're saying, maybe just in terms of really the drums, that Mitch Mitchell okay. drum vibe yeah. does does recall Hendrix. You know, yeah. you know. There was, a, there was so, a sonic nature in his singing that was very reminiscent to Jimi Hendrix. Okay, all right. So you're referring, you're referring more to the to the vocal. I mean, there definitely was a lot of, of callbacks. And this is when he first came out. But then he did find his own voice. So I'm trying to figure out like, how, how does someone do that? It's not just a self thing because when he self-taught and self got to the point where he could get some money and some backing, he sounded a lot like a Jimi Hendrix guy, you know? So how does he get to that next level? That third album, that fourth album. Well, that allow I'm biased because I'm a producer, but yeah. on my website, I have a section of before and afters where you can hear ah, like the demo yeah. or the recording that, that somebody made on their own. And then what the finished broadcast quality master I made right. is. That's, and, that's and cool. There, you, so you can hear the difference that a seasoned producer makes. But also, a seasoned producer also knows when the magic is already there and when to sit there and just hit record and don't say anything you do, you know, so I don't want to take anything away from the artist. A lot For of sure. times the artists have evolved there completely on their own. And the producer job is to not, get, not get in the way of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it, it might be to remind them, Whoa, wait, you're there. You're already there. You don't need to like keep trying to evolve or you know uh, you know force of force an evolution. It sounds great. You're there. Yeah. You know. Um, now, I want you, we're running low on time, so I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about this because I love this idea and it's the music industry has evolved so much. I don't want to say it's any harder or easier because it's never been easy. You always mm-hmm. have to find an audience. And, and where they are is, is changed dramatically, but there's still formulas, there's still things you can do as you try to figure out what your thing is. One of the things that you do is you do these retreats out in Malibu. That doesn't suck. Out in a, a house out there, and you cover a lot of this music industry stuff. So I was hoping that you kind of give us an idea of what these events are about. And, you know, when someone who's considering getting into the music industry and they're listening to this, they're like, oh, shit. I need to be in Malibu with Joe. Yeah, um, it's its official name is Joe Solo's Malibu Beach House Music Success Retreat. All right. You had me at Joe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and all levels from absolute beginner to seasoned professional go. All ages, races, styles. It's just people who are serious about having a career in music. And in one weekend... We're going to design a personal roadmap to music success. Wow. So uh, we have a we have a, a opening party Friday night where people get to know each other. Yeah. And Saturday morning, a lot of the actual coaching begins. But we go, I run it in a way where I'm not just talking all the time, but it's more of a conversation where anybody can chime in on anything at any time we get a real good synergy going. Like when we do a song analysis, I'll give my take on it. But then the other people who are attending will also have a different perspective. And so you get a lot of feedback that you need to hear. And then we also have a panel of seven music supervisors and publishers and managers come in Saturday afternoon. And for those who, who are staying overnight and there's only 15 slots for that and there's only 30 total slots for the whole thing Hmm. so keep it real small and intimate so everyone gets to know everyone really well and they everyone becomes each other's support and network for the rest of life really and after the panel we we break for an hour and then we have dinner with the panelists catered by a hollywood health chef that's how you have to do it in malibu (laughs) <laughs> well, you so don't bring in pizza. Here, here's a chance for people to start their own relationship with these people that it might take ten years to to right. be able to like knock on their door. And here you are having dinner with them. Everybody kind of hangs out afterwards. I stay there the whole time, the whole weekend. Uh, I stay there as well. And then on Sunday we continue on with with the coaching. 
and we do some breakout songwriting sessions and some other things like that. And then there's a bunch of giveaways at the end. Monday morning, check out and say goodbye. But that's not it. Because the whole point is to get a personalized roadmap yeah. to your music success. So t- starting two weeks after the retreat, I'll do, depending on what level people buy, anywhere between an hour and four hours of one-on-one consultations. So they could take everything that they've learned at the retreat, let it marinate in their brain for a few weeks, and then that's where we tie together a custom plan. That's like that's huge to get the access to the people that they need access to, but then also like this follow on stuff is I mean, having a plan that's executable, right writing workshops, that's enormous. What but what level band member you said all all levels, but absolute beginner to to seasoned professional. Yeah. People who are serious about really serious about being successful in music and if that's the thing is that you really gotta make your best shot at it. And you can't make one single shot. You got to keep going and going and going and just never, ever, ever, ever give up. What you don't want to do is spend your last 10 or 15 years of life wondering, hmm, I wonder what could have happened. Yeah. And then you see your colleagues and friends are making it and living in a mansion and playing their music, and touring the world. And, you're, you know, maybe you gave up at some point. Yeah, you're right. And you got to got to keep pressing on. I suppose something like like the workshop, the retreat, you know, Paul Williams came to Hollywood to become an, a leading man actor, you know, and he's a tiny little dude. Turns out he's a Hall of Fame songwriter instead. But you can go to something like this and start to realize, yeah, maybe my spot isn't to hold the guitar and sing these country songs. Oh yeah. But I can absolutely I turns out I can write these soul songs. Like uh, we had um, Ali Willis Mm-hmm. on on the show um her show will go up probably right around the time this one does and she can write beautiful soulful funky music but she's a white lady from detroit but she had this this black person's soul in her you mm-hmm. know and you have to go to a place like this to have someone say no it's okay person who doesn't fit this description you still have this kind of uh, musical soul, so let it out, you know? Yeah, and you don't even have to be a musician. There's so many different roles in the industry. Like, the whole industry is seated with people who started out sure. as an artist or in a band. Yeah. And then, for whatever reason, they decided, well, that direction's not working for them. But maybe they became an entertainment attorney right. or a publicist or a publisher or a promoter. I mean, there's just so many other ways to be involved in music. And we go over those things at the workshop as well. Yeah. We go over cool. marketing principles. We go over uh, the creative aspect, you know, the actual music. We go over the personal sense of self aspect, the oh, character that's cool. aspect. Yeah. That's that's huge. We go over basic deal structures and copyright because you have to know this stuff so that if you walk into a room of industry professionals, you know, A and R people at the record label and you're talking with them and they say some terms, and you look like you don't even get what they're talking about. Yeah. Then they're not going to want to have anything to do with you business-wise. Because you're not ready to be in the room. You're not ready. Yeah. So this is about getting ready. Yeah. And you, know, you can change your life. It's just it's life-changing in one weekend. I want to ask you more, but we're out of time, so we're going to have to have you come back on. But I want to ask well, you we'll about... let do a part two. Yeah, yeah, no, because I really want to get into... And I'm letting you get away with it because it's your first time. But normally I'd be like, stop everything. We're talking about this. But bring the clever. It's clever. And I want to get into that, but not this episode. But you, you remind when you when you say that, I think about the band Pomplamoose because they do all these clever covers of all these incredibly successful songs. So you go into all the single ladies and you get Beyonce's version. And then the next one in the queue is Pomplamoose, you know, and they just do these. Fant- Have you seen or heard of their stuff at all? I've never even heard of them, but now I'm excited to check them out. Oh, yeah. Once you start watching, you're going to be like, yeah, they bring the clever a ton. They, they're they fantastic. The the wife of the, and the couple, uh, Natalie Dawn, she's been on the show before. But that thing, that bringing the clever, I would love to get more into that. And so, uh, yeah, please come back on. Let's do this again. And if you're down to, we'd love to have you sit in and do an album fight with us oh, as well. Oh, you can count on that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Hashtag do the work. Hashtag album fight. Hey, everybody. It's Joe Solo, JoeSolo.com. You can go to at Joe Solo one or at Pete A. Turner at John LG 69 or at break it down show. 
Thank you again to Nam and the folks there that give us access because we get to talk to folks like you and Wes maybe and Allie Willis and all these other Nam members. It's such a great thing. It's it's sort of like it's part I don't know. It's like part convention, part workshops like crazy on any show. kind of time. Yeah, it's such a well, it's big. It's like two hundred thousand people there. It's, it's just crazy, crazy energy. It's awesome. Yeah, they've almost expanded outside of the expanded Anaheim Convention Center. Like it's that big, and it's it's a blast. So I appreciate them giving access and appreciate you and your time today. Oh, my valuable. pleasure, my pleasure. And uh, thank I'm you. I'm going to so be much. speaking at the Canadian Music Week. Uh, on May 9th, if anybody's going to be there. Nice. Um, yeah, come on, see Joe. Doing a keynote on the uh, application of three dimensional audio Whoa. from a record producer's perspective. Yeah. And that's how actually how I met Joe. I was able to grab him after one of his talks at NAMM, so he's definitely approachable. And it's, seriously, if you've got the bug and you're thinking about music as possibly a new career or an emerging artist like bull moose and you guys want to spend the money malibu and joe solo is a good way to go hey thank you man my pleasure